Academics have made significant advances in many fields over the last century or so, including Albert Einstein's progress on the theory of relativity, Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin, and Francis Crick and James Watson's discoveries about DNA etc. However, there is one area of study where we haven't made much progress, and that is economics. For the investor's benefit, a growing economy is an important assumption for his long-term returns, which is why this is one of the book's top five takeaways. How an economy grows and why it crashes. Written by Peter Schiff, this article will provide you with the best tips and tools for achieving financial freedom through stock market investing. Takeaway number one is that the primary goal is to increase productivity. First, we'll go over three concepts that are critical for an economy's growth, followed by two factors that are critical for an economy's growth but can cause it to crash if mishandled. An excellent definition of an economy. Is this an effort to make the most of limited resources in order to meet as many human demands as possible? We have high expectations. Food and shelter are basic needs, but we also want more advanced things these days, like smartphones with the latest technologies and supercars with great acceleration and environmental bragging rights. Assume that it used to take people an average of 0.2 working days to meet their daily food demand. 1,000 days to meet their demand for shelter. It takes 10 days to get that cool smartphone and 600 days to get the supercar. Today, however, meeting those demands takes only 0.1 day, 500 days, 5 days, and 300 days. The economy has since expanded. Productivity growth has made food shelter, smartphones, and supercars, which are of course limited in quantity, more accessible to the general public. An economy's goal is to achieve this. When compared to buying just one house before, you can now get a house, a supercar, 10 smartphones for all your relatives, and food for 1,000 days and still have 50 days left for leisure time. This can only be a good thing. Consider how many days you could spend reading books in a nice hammock. Super costs do not produce themselves at a cost of 300 working days rather than 600 days. By chance, there are a few requirements for this. It usually requires new tools, which result from innovation, which results from savings and risk-taking. Nobody is particularly creative. If he has to work all day just to meet his family's basic needs, such as putting food on the table. Savings are required for an economy to increase its productivity, which is the primary goal, and this is what we'll cover in the next takeaway takeaway. Number 2 Everyone benefits from savings. Savings are important for an economy's growth for several reasons. Peter Schiff's book, White Crushes, provides an excellent example of how an economy grows and white crushes about three fishermen living on a deserted island, but you'll have to get it for yourself. However, consider it this way. There must be savings for every large or semi-large project. If no one in the economy saved more than a single day's worth of money, how would large infrastructure projects, new medicines, and industrial innovations be built? Such projects can cost up to 1,000 days of savings from 1,000 different people to complete. Now, not all savings are created equal. Some contribute to faster economic growth than others. Savings can be put to use in four different ways. They can be saved for a rainy day, consumed for extra fun, lent to someone in need, or invested. The first option does not directly help the economy grow, but it is an excellent buffer in times of turmoil. During the current pandemic, some individuals, businesses, and governments have learned this the hard way. The second option does not help the economy grow. This is the worst way to spend money. The economy does not grow as a result of increased consumption. According to Peter Schiff, we consume more because the economy grows. Believing that we can spend ourselves out of economic difficulties is the main problem with the current paradigm within the field of economics. Consuming more than we can afford today will eventually be troublesome either for our future selves or for our children. Loans are the third option. And, if made for business rather than consumption, they can really help an economy grow. Consider the aspiring entrepreneur who has no savings, either from himself or from someone else. He or she cannot possibly start his or her own business because he or she will require a consistent source of income to provide for his or her family. The fourth option, investments, is excellent for the same reasons that business loans are excellent. By examining these four alternatives, it is clear that a capitalistic economy works. The lender wants interest payments, and the investor wants dividends. Both are selfish goals, but they will benefit everyone else in the economy as well. If the person with savings wants to increase the value of his savings, 
he must invest or lend them to others. Opportunity, costs, and pretty much everything else are all very important concepts here. Savings are scarce. Savings that are put to good use. This money could have gone towards business loans or investments. As a result, it is detrimental to the growth of our economies that most governments pursue monetary policies that encourage consumption while discouraging lending and investment. But I'm getting ahead of myself. But more on that later. Takeaway number 3. Advantages in comparison. Once upon a time, the only things that mattered were food, shelter, smartphones, and supercars. In other words, not dissimilar to the one we have today. Only four people lived in this economy, and they were all equally interested in food, shelter, smartphones, and supercalls. They were not, however, as efficient in producing these items. Babel Cable and Durable could produce one day's worth of food in 0.2 days of work, whereas Able could produce it in 0.1 days. Babel was the most productive shelter manufacturer. He could build one in 500 days, whereas others took years. A 1000 Cable was a gifted smartphone designer who produced one in five days while the others took 10. Similarly Durable was the most skilled supercar manufacturer, with a production time of over 300 days rather than 600 days. Just like the others. They should be able to produce food if they use their talents optimally. Babel constructed the shelter's cable, assembled the smartphones, and you are now able to create the super cause. They each require food for about 30,000 days in their lifetime. Five is home to 500 smartphones. Yes, these guys are clumsy and make 10 great calls. If they do not use their skills or comparative advantages optimally and produce everything themselves, they will have approximately 10 11,000 days of leisure over their lifetime. However, if they use their comparative advantages and let each do what he is best at, then trade goods with each other, they will have between 18 and 20,000 days. Simply put, if workers in an economy specialize in what they are best at, the economy's productivity will rise. Comparative advantages are important for the domestic economy, but they are also important for the global economy. For example, if King and Ling from the outside country of Babel, Babel, Cable, and Durable could produce food in 0.05 working days and shelters in 250, everyone would have even more leisure time. Furthermore, more savings would be available for business loans and investments, potentially increasing economic productivity even further down the road. But what would become of Abel and Babel? Well, with some savings or possibly a business loan from Cable and Durable, they'd probably discover that everyone else is interested in buying some fancy clothes and fancy watches now that there's so much more time to remember this. An economy's goal is not to create jobs. In an economy where productivity is increasing and comparative advantages are maximized, prices should actually be decreasing. Ling can sell shelters for 350 working days and still make a profit, whereas Babel had to sell them for 600 working days to make the same profit. The fourth point is the government's role. There are a few services that, for one reason or another, should be provided to everyone in an economy but are not provided well by a free market. Almost everyone agrees that such needs are those of personal safety and justice, for example, and you might consider giving away some of their production to hire Enable for security and Fable. For justice, Enable and Fable would be hired as government employees in this country. One thing to keep in mind is that the government does not produce the basic needs of the economy. For this reason, it uses taxpayer savings to provide services. Government spending equals taxpayer spending. Never, ever forget this. A bit more doubtful is when the government begins to provide services such as healthcare, infrastructure, education, and banking in the final takeaway. Sure, these are all services that are in high demand in today's economy, there is no doubt about it. The question is simply whether the government can provide them in a more efficient manner than the market can. Politicians desire re-election. As a result, governments spend savings where it is politically most important to do so, whereas private lenders only spend savings where it is economically defensible to do so. Private lending is more effective at bringing out the strongest species and hastening societal evolution. Again, the key concept is opportunity, followed by costs. As previously stated, savings are required for the economy to grow but they are limited, and keep in mind that the government is nothing more than a facilitator of private savings. If the savings are squandered, the economy will grow much more slowly than it could. It even causes it to crash in some cases during the financial crisis. For example, 
one could argue that the government played a significant role in the downfall. Government policies contributed to the recent increase in housing prices. Federal interest rates have been reduced to make borrowing more affordable, and banks have been encouraged to issue riskier mortgages because they know they can immediately sell these loans to governmental entities known as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. In other words, the government decided that private savings in the United States should be used to improve the housing standards of its citizens, particularly those with limited financial resources. Let's just say that this was a very poor use of savings. If you want to learn more about Watson's financial crisis wisdom, Check out my 5 crash summary of the history of the United States. Takeaway number 5. The role of banks. Banks serve two important functions in society. They allow people to save in a secure manner and they can make more educated decisions about how savings should be allocated than the average person. Banks increase the productivity of savings, interest rates, or payments to those who decide to lend their money in this manner. Banks are determined by three factors. The desire to maximize deposit returns the fear of losing capital on risky projects, and the desire to maximize deposit returns. A consumption time preference. Here's something interesting about the economy today. What would you say if the government decided that the price of a car must be fixed at $20,000 or that a smartphone must cost $500? You'd most likely yell communism. We don't like it when the government intervenes in the price and production of goods, because we've seen what it's done to economies in the past. However, for some reason, we are fine with the government determining the price of savings and loans in the United States. Through the federal funds rate, the Fed effectively determines the price of money by deciding the interest rates at which all other banks can borrow and lend. Here are three reasons why it would be preferable to have individual banks decide on this rate themselves, as in any other aspect of a modern economy, rather than a centralized entity. The federal representatives do not have the same stake in the game as the bank's owner. As a result, they make short-term decisions that an individual bank's business owner would never make. It is highly doubtful that the centralized Fed can make more informed decisions than the sum of millions of independent decisions. In the marketplace, at least, they are more or less independent. The Fed typically bases its decisions on political rather than economic considerations. The chairman of the Federal Reserve, for example, is appointed by the President of the United States. As a result, the fates of the president and the Fed chair are inextricably linked. And I'm sure you can see what kind of consequences this could have. Today's inflationary monetary policies are detrimental to our economies. They are harmful because they encourage spending rather than saving. As we saw in the takeaway, inflation is simply a means of transferring wealth from anyone who has savings in a particular currency to anyone who has debt in the same currency. Number 2 Savings are required for an economy to grow more than credit and leverage being used foolishly has been one of the primary causes of all five of history's greatest economic crashes.